So Paul wrote and told Timothy, he said, physical training is good, spiritual training is better because it impacts this life and the life to come. So in this campaign, this spring, we want to take the, the good and the better and put them together to, to be in the best physical and spiritual shape that we've ever been as a church across the board. So you've got the, the card there in your seats. There's going to be some uh, people in the back in the lobby. As you leave today, they'll have the Imago Day shirts on. If you want to stop, talk to them, find out more about the different groups that they're going to be leading as we jump into this campaign uh, next week. So... Um, I want to take you back, share a story to get us started as we continue on in this Let There Be Light. As we're looking at scripture from start to finish over this year of 2020. And back in the summer of 2007, I found myself on a mission trip on the other side of the world, literally. Kathmandu, Nepal was where I was. I'd been on mission trips before. This, this wasn't something new for me, but God would use that trip more than any other in my life. God would use that trip on the other side of the world when you know, I was just a, a, in between my freshman and sophomore year of college to radically shift the direction of my life, completely change where I thought I was going, completely alter the plan that I had put in place. You see, I had just finished my freshman year as a biology major. I was planning to finish that degree and then go on to some type of medical school. As you can see, that did not happen, right? And that didn't happen because of that trip. What God did while we were there on that, specifically on the first Sunday morning that we were there, because we were planning to go to all of these little churches around Kathmandu and the surrounding area, and all the pastors that were with us were going to be preaching that morning. I thought I'm just the, the good Christian college student that goes on mission trips in the summer because that's what you're supposed to do. And man, this will be a cool experience. I'll get to see Mount Everest. And that's it. Until that Sunday morning, as I was getting ready, I had a knock on my hotel room door. And it was our Nepali partner who was coming to tell me, hey, Skip, all of the pastors who were supposed to preach this morning at these churches, they're sick. And so in my mind, I thought, great, we get a free day, right? Like, pastors are sick. We're not going to go to these churches. We'll just get to hang out, you know, in this awesome hotel. I might get to explore some of Kathmandu. I get a free day. That's when he said, no, we're, we're still going, and you're going to preach. And that's when I got really sick, right? Because remember, I'm a freshman in college. I'm a biology major. I'm going to be a doctor. I don't preach. And I let him know that very quickly and kindly, to which he basically said, I don't care. You're preaching. Figure it out. And so I can remember, you know, in all of this fear and this, you know, just anxiety that swept over me, walking over to the corner of that hotel room, sitting down at this little table, taking out the little hotel Himalaya notepad that's there, and I flipped open my Bible to Exodus chapter 4. If you have yours with you, I want you to open up there as well, because we're going to go back and we're going to look at this passage that I ended up preaching that morning for the very first time through a translator in these little small house churches in Nepal. But God used it to radically shape my life. It completely changed the direction of my life. It led us to, to this point here today. I believe that passage, I believe that situation that day was divinely appointed for my life because I was living what I ended up reading. As we read this in Exodus chapter 4 and we see this situation where God has come to Moses and he's told him, look, you're going to be the one who goes back to Egypt. You're going to be the one that stands before Pharaoh and you're going to be the one that I'm going to use to lead my people, your people, out of captivity. And Moses starts backpedaling. And Moses starts offering all of these excuses. And, and Moses starts saying all of the reasons why he shouldn't be that person to follow that calling. Because at, my, or at that point in my life, I was running from a calling. Yeah, I had my plan that I was going to be the biology major and I was going to go to be a doctor and I was going to have you know, a big house and a successful career. I was running from a calling that God had on my life. I'd known for a long time that this is what I should have been doing, and, and God was telling me and urging me and speaking to me, but I was disobeying what God was clearly saying. I was afraid. I was selfish. I was stubborn. I was looking at all of the wrong things, and God used this passage and me preaching it to radically change my life. And here's what I believe, that 
It's not just me that can connect with this. It's not just Moses that struggled with this. I believe that every single one of us in here has a little bit of Moses in us because we're all human, right? We, we all have this same response when God comes and, and he meets with us and he puts something in our life or, or plan or purpose before us. We all usually have the same response. And I want us to look at Moses' life. I want to learn from it and I want us to apply it to our lives. I believe we all have these same obstacles to obedience that hold us back from taking those steps of faith that God is calling us to take. Steps of obedience, steps of opportunity, steps of operating in the the callings and the purposes that God has placed on every single one of our lives. Now, if you haven't been here, we're walking through Scripture, right? Hopefully you've accepted the challenge and you're reading through Scripture on your own every day through the app that we have connected with ours. It says we're walking from Genesis to Revelation. And if you've been here, we've been kind of following along with our Sunday mornings. And obviously we can't preach every single passage. And we've got to make some big jumps. And so we took basically the month of January and walked through Genesis, 50 chapters did our best to cover those big themes and high points of the story of creation and fall and and now this redemptive plan that's been put into place. And now we make the transition to the book of Exodus. This coming out of captivity in Egypt, this wandering in the wilderness, but this ultimately getting to the promised land that God desired for his people. And if you were... Um, here in those months, or if you've been reading along and know, Genesis chapter 50 ends with Joseph having this kind of prophetic blessing or reminder to his brothers. If you haven't read it, Joseph is a a son of, of Jacob there, and his brothers are jealous of him. They sell him into slavery. Joseph has this rough 13 years, but God uses that to put him in charge of Egypt, basically. And so Joseph's brothers and the family come down trying to escape a famine, but what they find is that they run into their brother and they get forgiveness. They get restoration. They get healing for their family. They stay there, but Joseph dies telling his brothers, look, you're not going to stay here. You're not supposed to be here in Egypt forever. God made a promise way back to Abraham, and God's going to make good on his promises. God's going to come and visit you, he's going to care for you, and he's going to get you to where he desires for you to be. And now we get to see the beginning of that promise fulfilled in Exodus. In Exodus chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see the nation of Israel grow. They grow to a point to where Egypt's beginning to get afraid. They think, okay, we have these people who are connected to us, but they're not really our people. Okay, and so... Pharaoh begins to think and say, okay, what happens if if Israel turns on us? What happens if an enemy comes to us and and Israel joins with them? They will destroy us. So in order to keep Israel down, they put them into bondage, right? Slavery. They begin to work them harder, trying to break this people, keep them under control. It gets so bad, they're so fearful that Pharaoh makes a decree that says, okay, all all the firstborn males must be murdered, thrown into the Nile. Let's reduce this population in the next generation of Israel. There's a young Hebrew boy that's born. His mother, being commanded to throw him into the river, decides to, I'm going to put him in the river, but I'm going to put him in a basket. I'm going to make sure he's safe, and, and hopefully God will do something with it, and sends him down the river only to have Pharaoh's daughter see this baby, who we know ends up being Moses. He's raised in Pharaoh's palace. He's trained as an Egyptian, but he knows that he's a Hebrew. One day, he he sees one of his Hebrew brothers being treated poorly and beaten by an Egyptian, and he responds, and he kills this Egyptian, realizing now that he's a murderer, he flees. He lives in the wilderness as a shepherd for 40 years, and that's where we pick up verses or chapters 3 and 4. Remember this famous story of of the burning bush, right? So so all that has happened to Moses. He's out there. He's just living as a shepherd thinking, okay, God's done with me. This is just going to be my life. I'll live here. I'll die here. And then this bush bursts into flames, but it's not being consumed. And he begins to hear his name called out from the bush, and God's begin to lay out this plan and this purpose for his life. Moses, you're going to be my spokesperson. 
You're going to be the leader that goes back into Egypt, goes before Pharaoh, and tells him to let my people go. And that's when the excuses start, right? That's when the obstacles of obedience start coming in, and we see Moses responding just like we respond so many times in chapter 4. So let's read, picking up in chapter 4. Verse 1, right in the middle of this dialogue between God and Moses where he's saying, hey, go, I'll be with you. I am that I am. You know, this incredible statement of who God is. And he says, just go and trust me. And Moses keeps pushing back. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? Staff. Remember, he's been a shepherd. This is just a, a tool of his trade. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand, and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand inside of his cloak. And then he took it out, and behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. Then God said, put your hand back in your cloak. So he put his hand back in his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. And if they will not believe even those two signs, listen Or listen to your voice. You shall take some of the water from the Nile and pour it out on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become like blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and I'll teach you what you shall speak. But Moses said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time and this year that you've called us to, Lord, a a year of studying your word cover to cover. Seeing the themes play out, God, seeing your character, your nature, who you are. Lord, I thank you for this time and, and this place that we're in, God. I pray that we would all be led out of captivity and enter the promised land that you desire for our lives. Lord, out of being a slave to sin, a slave to fear, a slave to assumptions and excuses, all of these things that, that keep us where we are instead of taking those steps that you desire for us. God, may we see who you are more clearly today. May we believe it. May we respond to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, We're going to look at three obstacles to obedience. God has come to Moses. He has clearly spoken, right? He has said his name. He has told him, this is what you are to do. And Moses starts to push back. And in every one of our lives, in large ways and in small, I'm sure we could go around and and say, okay, this is the thing that God has placed on my heart, and this is an area where he's calling me, and I know this is a, a step that I should take. And we see these same obstacles to obedience show up in our lives. The first one, number one, is believing assumptions. We see that right in verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, we see Moses is believing assumptions. It says, then then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The first pushback. The first obstacle to to Moses taking this step is that he's believing these assumptions, thoughts and things that have not and probably will not happen. But did you hear how Moses is saying it? He's saying it as if it's a done deal, right? 
But God's told him to go, and his response is, no, 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 I'm not going. They're not going to believe me. And not only are they not going to believe me, they're going to say, we don't believe you, and God hasn't spoken to you. And he allows this thing that has not, probably will not, and even if it does, it doesn't really matter because of who's behind him, right? He allows these assumptions to keep him where he is. How many times is that the case in our lives? That God tells us to do something, but we, we just know, right? We, like, what, like we can tell the future. That this is how it's going to happen, and this is what they're going to say, and this is how they're going to respond, and, and this is what they're going to do. And we think we know the future, but who's the only one who knows the future? The one who told us to take the step of faith in the first place. Instead of trusting him that you know, and, and you've planned, and you've prepared, and, and you are going to work this out for me. Instead of just trusting him, we try to say, you know what? I know better than you, God. I know how this is going to play out, and it's not going to play out well for me. As the French philosopher, Michael de Montaigne, who once said, My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. How true is that, right? How true is that in our lives? You can think about, man, you're thinking about the week ahead, right? Man, how bad this meeting's going to be and how bad that test is going to go and how, man, this person's not going to respond the way I want them to respond. And all of a sudden, our life is filled with all these terrible misfortunes that never end up happening. We live in this fear. We live in this doubt. We live in with all these assumptions of how things are going to be and we've played them out in our mind, but we don't know. And we're not in control, and yet we allow those things to control us, don't we? We allow those things to keep us out in the wilderness, just keeping some sheep instead of going where God wants us to go and delivering the people that he wants us to deliver. That, that phrase, we know it's true, we've experienced it. There's actually a, a study done recently that, that shows the reality of it in our lives. For the study, the researchers at Penn State University they asked people with generalized anxiety disorder to write down everything that they worried about for a month, okay? So everything that came up, as soon as you worried, you had to recognize it, write it down, and we're going to see how this plays out. And then the study participants were asked to also record the outcomes of their worries. The researchers found that 91% of the people's worries did not come true. Over nine out of ten things that they thought, man, this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to respond. This is what's going to go down. 91% of the time, no, it didn't. For several of the people in the study, exactly 0% of the things they worried about actually happened. I know they're going to say this, God. I know they're going to do that. I know this is what's going to happen. I, I know, I know, I know. And then none of it happens, does it? And yet it has kept so much control on our lives. But here's the real problem in this. This is Moses' problem. This is my problem. This is your problem. Whenever we're believing the assumptions, the problem comes when we focus on what people might say instead of what God did say. Did you get that? That, that's what Moses is doing here. You can go back and read all of chapter 3 and all of this amazing truth that God has said. Mark it down. Take it to the bank. You can rely on this. And yet, what is Moses focusing on? What they might say. This is what these people could say when I go. But, but what did God say? But what has he already clearly spoken and clearly said in and for your life, Moses? It doesn't matter what they might say. All that matters is what did God say? God told Moses to go. God told Moses, this is who I am. I am that I am. I am all sufficient. I'm everything you need. I was past, present, future. I am, okay, Moses? That's all you need to know. And I am going to be with you. What does it matter what they say? And that every single one of us has those same things spoken into our lives. God's told you different things to do, different ways to respond, different ways to live your life. He's told you who he is, right? That's what we're doing this year. We're reading 66 books that tell us who God is, what he's done, what he's like. And he's told us way more than just the two times that you see in these two chapters, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. 
over and over and over again in Scripture. I will be with you even to the end of the age. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man trips us up, right? The fear of man is an obstacle to, to us going and doing what God has called us to do. But those who trust in the Lord will be exalted. That he'll, he'll lift us up. He'll carry us to where we need to be. When we're not focused on man and what they might say, but what did God say? Isaiah 51, 12, where God is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he says, I, yes, I, I'm the one who comforts you. So why are you afraid of mere humans? who wither like the grass and disappear. Psalms 118.6, the Lord is on my side. i got God on my team, so I will not fear. What can man do to me when God's on my side? And we have all of those promises. We have this assurance. And yet so many times we forget that and we focus on assumptions, what, what they might do. What they might say, what might happen. Are you believing God in his word? Or are you taking the steps of faith that he's calling you to take? Are you responding in obedience? Are you letting this first obstacle trip you up? Because then we see the second one. The second obstacle to obedience, number two, is offering excuses. But Moses goes from this in verse one of, man, man, I know, I'm just telling you, this is how they're going to respond. This is what they're going to say and do. So verse 10, just flat out offering an excuse. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I'm slow of speech and of tongue. God, I, I can't go and talk to Pharaoh. I don't speak well. I can't go and deliver this message to a nation of millions of people. I've got a stutter. I've got a speech impediment. I've got all of these excuses, all of which aren't true, by the way. You go and read Acts 7 when Stephen is having this great sermon before he's killed, and he says, look, Moses was eloquent and powerful in speech. It's just another lie, an assumption that Moses has bought into. It's just a, an excuse to get him out of doing what God has called him to do. But I want us to look at everything around this excuse. Because again, it's, it's Moses is focusing on the wrong thing. Because back up a little bit and let's not miss these three incredible miracles just before this, right? Like so he says, I can't go. They're not going to believe me. And God gives him these three miracles back to back to back. Okay, Moses, what's in your hand? Just a shepherd's staff. Just a piece of wood. Nothing special. Throw it on the ground. Boom. Boom instantly turns into this scorpion, one that's scary enough that causes Moses to turn and run away, right? Like, this is not just some magic trick. This is not some hologram or deception. I believe the miraculous took place, and God took a stick and made it into a snake instantly. And then he said, reach down and pick it up. As soon as he reached down and picked it up in obedience, boom, it turned back into a stick. And then he says, take your hand, Moses, st stick it into your cloak, Pull it back out, and boom, leprous, white as snow, a death sentence at this time. I'm sure panic and fear and anxiety starts rising up in him like, oh my gosh, I, well, uh, put it back in. Puts it back in, instantly healed. Take a glass of water, scoop some up from the Nile, and pour it out, and it's still water in the cup, but as soon as you pour it out and it hits the dry ground, boom, it's blood. Now, these are not just three random cool party tricks that God has brought out to show Moses. These were intentional. This was specific to deal with the nation of Egypt, right? First, the serpent. It was known that, you know, the different sorcerers and, and, and practicers of witchcraft and the religious leaders of Egypt had a trick where they could take a snake and they could kind of hypnotize it to where it was stiff as a stick, but it was still a snake. And then Pharaoh would wear his crown, you know, that looked like the, the hood of a cobra. Figure of a snake coming off the front of it, showing their power, their control over Egypt and most of the world. Leprosy, as I said, is a death sentence at this time. Egypt, with all their power, with all their wisdom, with all the great brains and everything that they had at the time, threw everything they had at leprosy and couldn't cure it. 
The Nile, the symbol of Egypt, right? Egypt was the Nile, and the Nile was Egypt. That, man, this is where the life flowed in, and this is why they were so prosperous. You think you're so prosperous? I'll turn it to whatever I want to, whenever I want to. This was God's way of saying to Egypt, look, as powerful, as strong, as mighty as you might think you are, I'm the one that controls life. I'm the one who can heal in an instant. I'm the one who controls everything. And you would think that, man, Moses, after he sees this, like he would be pumped up and ready to go, right? Like kicking in the door of Pharaoh's palace. Let my people go because of the God that I serve. Yet Moses sees that and his response is, yeah, I don't speak well. What? Mm -hmm. Did you just, like he he turned a stick into a snake and and he could heal in an instant. He can do whatever, that's the God that's behind you, Moses. And you're worried about how eloquently you can give a public address? What does that have to do with anything that I've said? I didn't say anything about how well you could or could not speak. Moses, this is not about you. This is about the God who says he'll speak through you. And that's what we need to realize in all of our excuses for whatever God's called you to do. It's not about you. God doesn't come to Moses and pat him on the back and try to give him just a self-help speech. to go, no, 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 Moses, you are good enough. You can speak well enough. No, he doesn't. Because in all honesty, Moses, you don't speak well enough. And you're not a good enough leader. And you're not strong enough. And you can't do this. But I am. I am. I was reading an article recently about the top ten reasons that people don't accomplish their goals. It wasn't a Christian article and no spiritual purpose. It was just, you know, this you know, leadership and growth article. But hey, this is the reasons that people say they don't accomplish what they set out to accomplish. But I thought it was so interesting seeing all of these excuses and how often we use them with God as well. To not step out and do the things he's calling us to do. Here was the top ten. Number one, lack of money. Can't do it because I don't have enough money, right? And it takes money to do this or that. So, so I'm out because I don't have enough. Number two was lack of time. I'm just too busy, can't fit it in, all these other things going on. Maybe later. Number three, too overwhelmed. Maybe because of the lack of the money, and maybe because of the lack of time, I just, you know, I'm stressed out, I'm burnt out, I'm overwhelmed, I can't do it. Number four, it's just not the right time. Not saying I'm not going to do it, but, but just not right now, right? Maybe later, or, or maybe I just missed the boat. Number five, I'm just too afraid. Fear's keeping me from doing it. Number six, I'm too young or I'm too old. Number seven is kind of a catch-all, fill in the blank. I'm not blank enough. You fill it in. I'm not smart enough. Not connected enough, not created enough, not educated enough, not, not, not enough. Number eight, it's just too hard. Number nine, back to the assumptions we just talked about. What will other people think of me? So I'm just, I'm done. Number 10, what if I fail? All of these excuses, so many times the same things that we offer to God. God, I can't do that. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough strength. I don't have enough people. I don't have enough whatever. But I don't believe that our excuses are really what they seem to be on the surface. I don't believe Moses' excuse is what it seems to be on the surface. And I think if you took all of these, all ten of them, and add however many you want to, when you boil them all down, specifically when we're talking about what God is calling us to do, what we're really saying in all, in all of it is, God, you're not enough. It doesn't matter if it's money or time. People, possessions, whatever, in all of our excuses, whatever we offer to God as a reason to not do what God's calling us to do, deep down inside, at the heart of it, we're saying, God, you're not enough. And you didn't give me enough. And our excuses are just this facade, this cover, this screen for what's really in the depths of our hearts and our mind. And that is, God, you're not enough. And that's not just my opinion. Look at God's response here when he says, look, God, oh, Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to me. I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Okay, when you say that, you're talking about me now. You're saying I didn't craft your mouth well enough. And look, I made you just the way I wanted to make you. 
And I put you exactly where I wanted you to be, and I'm the one that's going to be with you. God sees this isn't really about Moses' mouth at all. This is his way of saying, God, no, 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 I'm not good enough, and you're the one who made me. All of our excuses are an affront to God. That you messed up, that you didn't do this, that you didn't do that, and when you boil it all down, our excuses are not ultimately a wrong view of us but a wrong view of God. Because if we really believed that God was enough, he'd be enough. We wouldn't look at our excuses. We wouldn't look at our shortcomings. We wouldn't look at our deficits, right? Because we would see that he's big enough and he's powerful enough and he's creative enough and he has enough money and he controls time. Like we would see that he is enough and whatever he's called us to do, I'm going to quit looking at me and I'm going to look to him and I'm going to believe you are enough. Because even though we've just read, you know, one book so far, maybe two if you're really keeping up, You read those, and when God's enough, a man makes a boat when it's never rained for a flood that's supposed to wipe out the whole world. When God is enough, a hundred-year-old man with a barren wife becomes the father of a nation. When you just look at that, you say, okay, this doesn't make sense, but when you look at God and say, I'm just going to quit looking at me, and I'm going to believe that you're enough, it can happen. A boy sold into slavery becomes his brother's savior. And as we go on and on to read, seas part and giants fall and fires don't burn and the mouths of lions close and and manna appears, the sun stands still, sickness is gone, death is erased, tombs become empty. Stop offering excuses and start believing that God is enough, that he can, that he will That he is able, that it doesn't matter what you can or can't do, he is. Pastor Mark Batterson says, if you're looking for an excuse, you'll always find one. But the same is true for opportunities. So what are you looking for? You're looking for an opportunity? I want to be used by God. I want him to use me as unable as I am. I'm just going to believe that you're enough. And for a college freshman in the middle of Kathmandu, Nepal, whose greatest fear was public speaking, to say, all right, I'm not enough, but you are. And I'll just throw down whatever I have in my hand and trust that you will be enough. I read another study. The only requirement to be a part of this one was that the people had to be at least 95 years old or older. Okay? Pushing a century. And they asked all the people who had lived, you know, this entire century, one question. If you could live your life over again, what would you do differently? One of the top answers from all of the people in the study, I would have taken more risks. If I could go back. Hundred years in, I'd step out in faith. I'd take that risk. I wouldn't play it safe. I wouldn't allow fear to dictate my decisions. I think if we could go and ask Moses, you know, what would you have done differently? Man, I'd have quit offering these excuses. I stopped looking at myself and my own abilities, and I'd have just been obedient to whatever God said, whatever way God said it, as soon as He said it. Final obstacle to obedience after we've seen these first two of offering excuses and believing assumptions. Number three is just rejecting responsibility. This is the worst and the scariest and the saddest of them all. God's done all this. He's shown all this. He's responded every time. Then the Lord said to him, who's made your mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go. I will be with your mouth. I'll teach you what you shall speak. Verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Oh, my Lord, anybody but me. I don't want to do this. And he almost misses out on being the person that God uses to lead his people out of captivity 
and right up to the promised land. Because of assumptions and because of excuses and then finally just flat out disobedience. Just send somebody else. Thankfully, God didn't allow that. And my question, my concern today as we close is, what are you on the verge of missing out on because you're rejecting the responsibility that God has placed in your life? And he's been saying time and time again, like, you know, like this, this is what I should be doing and this is where we should be going. And man, this is the step of faith that God has for me and my family in this season. But you're believing assumptions and you're offering excuses and maybe you're just to the point where you're flat out saying, I'm not doing it. There's a book called Jonah that's about that, okay? We'll get there. What's he calling you to do, big or small? Miraculous or mundane, every day or once in a life. Maybe, man, it's that person that you know God wants you to share your story, to share God's story, to share your faith with them, and God's going to bring them out of the slavery of sin because of you being a messenger in their life. And every day, you offer the same excuse. You assume, no, 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 that this is how they'll respond. This is what they'll say. This is what it'll do to our relationship if I do or try or say, no, don't, don't believe that. What did God say? Maybe it's to meet that need that you see financially in that person's life. But you're afraid, man, if I do that, I won't have enough to be safe and secure. Instead of just believing, it's all from God. And he'll provide. And he'll meet the need. To step out in faith and to start that blank, you fill it in. That God wants to use for extraordinary things, that move, that child, that adoption, that phone call, that opportunity that scares you to death when you think about it, right? That maybe this whole sermon, your blood pressure's been up and your palms are sweaty and you're scared to death just thinking about it, but God won't let it go. Today, you need to put down all the excuses. Put down all the assumptions. Quit rejecting the responsibility and say, God, I'm not enough, but you are. And take that step. To be obedient to what he's called. I bet no one in here knows the name Nolan Bushnell. But he could be, right now, the financially richest man on the earth. Because I think, way back, 40 years ago, he missed out on the greatest business opportunity ever offered. You see, Nolan Bushnell was Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak's boss at Atari before Apple computers existed. And Jobs and Wozniak were making the Apple One computer, and they went to their boss at the time and said, hey, we think, you know, home computers are going to be the next big thing, and we've created this Apple computer, and we want to give you the opportunity to be the first big investor for this new company. $50,000 for a third of the entire company. You just finance it. We'll build it. We'll make it happen. Are you in? Fifty grand for a third of the company which as of January of this year was valued at $1.3 trillion, with a T, dollars. I'm not a math major. You can do that. Figure it up. A third of $1.3 trillion. A lot of money. At the time he said, I don't think home computers are the next big thing. I don't think anybody's ever going to buy one of these and put them in their houses. I don't think this is a wise investment at this time, right? He, he had all the excuses. I'm, I'm pretty good right now at Atari. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm not going to make this step into this opportunity. He missed out on a little bit. And this is going to sound like preacher talk, but I believe God offers us greater opportunities every day. Because listen, there's greater things than money. Store for yourself treasures in heaven where thieves don't break in and moth doesn't destroy God gives us opportunities every day to impact lives, which is the only thing that is going to be eternal, right? That person's soul. This doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. This doesn't mean you have to go be a missionary. But what it does mean is you have to be on mission wherever God has you. Say, I'll take that step of faith. I'll be obedient to that calling. And I might not speak well and only have a staff in my hand, but when I throw it down and give it to God, he can do the miraculous with it. He can do the extraordinary with the ordinary. 
Now, does this mean you're never going to wrestle with this again? Like you're going to go out of here, man, in perfect steps of faith every time? No. This doesn't mean that God is going to be disappointed if you ever do have those times of wrestling. You notice God was patient and merciful. And he kept responding to Moses like a good father. And it wasn't until just the flat-out rejection, I'm not doing it, that it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Because we have a good, good father who's very patient with us. And we have Jesus who's been there, right? We have verses like Hebrews 4.15 that tells us we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. But we have one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to wrestle with that obedience. He knows what it's like to be scared to take that next step. We have accounts like in the garden when he's so close to going to the cross, right? And he knows how painful it's going to be. And he knows how much it's going to hurt. He knows the separation. He knows the sin. He knows the weight. And he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, 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 not my will, but yours be done. So the question is not whether or not you're ever going to wrestle with things like this. The question is whose will is going to win? Yours or God's? I heard a pastor once talk about a defining moment in church. talking about a similar idea willing to do whatever it is God wants you to do go wherever give whatever nothing off limits he said at the end a young girl came to the altar at a communion table up front like many traditional churches she laid a folded piece of paper on the table and just walked out so the pastor went to go see, you know, what's, what's this great step of faith? What's this plan, this purpose on her life? And he, he picks up the paper and he unfolds it. And all he sees in big, bold letters on the paper is yes. He's confused. He's thinking, what, you know, specific callings. Like, wh- where are you going? What are you doing? So he tracked her down and said, you know, what, what does this mean? Yes. He said, I don't know exactly what God's calling me to do. I don't know exactly where he wants me to go. I wanted to show him that I'm ready for whatever it is. And I left my yes on the table. I left my yes there. What's God calling you to do? Where is he calling you to go? How is he calling you to change? Who is he calling you to tell? No assumptions. No excuses, no rejections, just obedience, just belief, just faith, just yes. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed. It's easy to talk about it in rooms like this. It's convicted and much struggles maybe you're feeling, it's, it's easy to hear it. What matters and what's important is what are you going to do when you leave here? When you get in your car and the assumptions start flooding back in, the lies and the excuses start taking back over. You're going to fall back on them? You're going to keep offering them? Keep rejecting, or it's today the day. We say no more. Never again. All in to everything you want, God. And as we're about to sing, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, I'll follow you anywhere. Father, I thank you for your word. And how this passage in the middle of Exodus from thousands of years ago still impacts our lives in powerful ways today. 
Thank you for your spirit here moving among us. God, for the ones you're calling out of slavery, of sin, fear, disobedience, doubt, rejection, rebellion, God, and into a new life and freedom in you. To see that you're enough. That you'll always be with them. And you'll provide everything that they need. God, I pray that that would be true in our lives. Every day. Not just in these moments. Set us free, Lord. Lead us out of the slavery. And into the promised land you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.